this morning I wanted to try something a bit different. I thought we would go through, or we see how far we get, we go through a book uh, in, in, in the New Testament. Uh, what Obviously, the early church, what would happen is when they would assemble together, they would read one of the letters, uh, obviously from Paul or Peter or what have you. And so I thought, you know, why don't we, why not, why don't we do the same uh, today? Just see how it goes. And I thought we'd go through Galatians. So we just, you know, read through it together, have commentaries. If anybody wants to add something in, please do. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just go through it together. I'm reading from the New King James Version. I thought I'd leave the King James uh, this time and uh, read from the New King James. And uh, we, we'll just, like I say, go through it chapter by chapter. How far we get, I don't know. And, uh, you know, just, just see how it goes. And if it's something that... Uh, Looks like it'll be a blessing, you know. Maybe we try it with other books as well, you know, go through various different books. Uh, amen. Obviously, Galatians chapter 1. And uh, verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me. Now, from the first verse, a great insight we can get there is that uh, the Apostle Paul said he wasn't appointed by men. Yeah. And and so, you know, when, when God calls you to do something, you know, you can have this assurance, you can have this knowledge that God has called me. So whether people like it, people cheer me on, people want to tear me down, it doesn't matter because my call comes from God. And so, you know, as, as for us, we can glean from there that we can have that confidence that if God has called us to do something, not only is he backing us, but it doesn't matter if people are against us or uh, this or that or the other. Amen. Yep. Amen. To the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God, the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 6. I, mar I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, obviously, we see that this is a very, very new church, and immediately the enemy has come in and brought a different message. And the message that was coming through was the, the Jewish Christians basically were, were bringing uh, the, the, the fact that they wanted the church to follow the law. They wanted them to be circumcised and, and keep the law, which was uh, not the gospel message. The gospel message is basically that we are not under the law. We are under grace. And even today, you see this conflict, even within the church circles. Well, are we under the law? Do we have to keep the law? You know, do we keep the Sabbath and all that sort of stuff? And one of the wonderful things of the, the, the gospel message is that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of those things. And for us as people, it's important to know, you know, you hear theologians will, will split up the law. They'll say, oh, you've got the moral law, and then you've got the ceremonial law, and then you've got the dietary law. Now, when you hear the law of Moses, God doesn't make a distinction. Uh, there's no God splitting the law into three. All of those things that theologians split into three parts, God says it's all the law of Moses. It's one law. And so when, when we talk about the law of Moses, it's all of the law, all of the Ten Commandments, everything. And uh, so that's important to know because when, uh, and I will get into it later on, but if you try to keep one part of the law, you know, just as a little bit of a thing, you, you are obliged to keep all of it. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to keep the Sabbath. No, you have to keep the whole law of Moses if you want to keep one part of the law. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that a bit further down. But he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. That's, that's pretty strong words there. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, and uh, that's how serious Paul takes it. As we have said before, verse, verse 9, so now say I again, if anyone preaches another gospel than that which you have received, uh, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For I still, if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. And so, you know, even for us, you know, we've got to uh, realize that uh, in the day and age we live in, uh, we've got to decide in our hearts, you know, we're going to please God. We're going to have a heart to please God. And so even if the message of the cross uh, offends people, even if uh, the government of the day doesn't like it and say, well, you, you, you can't say certain things anymore, you know, we've got to say, well, do we please men or do we please God? And, and uh, you know, make that stand. We, we do not seek to please men. We seek to please God and, and preach an uncompromised word. Uh, of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 11, he says there, But I make known to you, brother, brethren, that the gospel which uh, was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from a man, nor was I taught it, but, I, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure, and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the tradition of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And that is, a, as we go through these next following verses, the amazing uh, thing that we can actually apply to our lives is when God gives you something, sometimes the best thing we can do is keep our mouth shut. You know, if, if God gives you something, gives you a dream, gives you a vision, sometimes the best thing you can do is just stay quiet. You know, keep it to yourself, meditate on it, spend time with God, let it, let it grow on the inside of you. You know, one of the things that, that God was revealing to the Apostle Paul was to take the gospel message to the Gentiles. And, uh, you know, so in its infancy, if, if Paul had immediately gone to the church in Jerusalem, he would have had a huge uproar and, and ruckus, uh, you know, with people saying, no, you can't do that, you can't do that, and this and that and the other. Uh, you know, and take this message of the, of, uh, you know, to, to, the, to the Gentiles. It's, it's not for them. And so he, he allowed God to put it on the inside of him for uh, a number of years. And then we see after three years, he says, then after three years, verse 18, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and I remained with him 15 days, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not lie. Afterwards, I went into the regions of Syria and, Cil and Sicilia and was not known by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. And here's another great example of what you can do is go to one or two people. You know, if God gives you something, a dream or a vision, go to one or two people who you know will give you sound counsel. You know, and uh, and so we can see there he, he did exactly that. He went to one or two people, uh, basically sp spent a few days with with people who he knew uh, would would counsel him correctly, would minister to him. And the the thing is, the the person he went to was the right person because Peter was the first person ten years after the gospel was, or Acts two, uh, he preached to Cornelius. And uh, that we see that in Acts chapter 10. So Peter, the apostle Peter, was the first person to uh, preach to the Gentiles. And so uh, basically we see Paul made the right decision uh, in, in speaking to Peter about his, his call and ministry. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, let's, let's go to chapter 2. And he says there, then after 14 years... I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me. 
and I went up by revelation and communicated to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. And so even after 14 years of preaching his message, uh, he's still cautious about who he speaks to concerning uh, the, the vision and, and uh, the call on his life, the call that God has given him. And he says there, obviously, lest by any means I might run or I had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And so we see the pressure on the Gentile church in that day was the pressure to become circumcised and to follow the law. And that, that's a continual thing. You'll see that's later on in the book of Acts. You see the council at Jerusalem and things like that, uh, where all of this sort of kicked off. And so we see there's this continual pressure on, on uh, Gentile believers to become circumcised, to keep the law, which is exactly what Galatians is warning about. Uh, basically coming, like, or that being another gospel, that being a false gospel. Yeah. Amen. And this occurred. And this is Titus not being compelled to be circumcised. This occurred because false brethren secret, secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. And so the, the important thing to, to see there is when the Apostle Paul talks of bondage and, and you go through the rest of Galatians, when he's talking about bondage, he's not talking about sin. He's talking about the law. He's talking about the law of Moses. And so that's important to realize. And, I, you know, you can say, what? You, you serious? You know, yeah, I'm serious. You, you'll, you'll go through Galatians and you'll see that, that the bondage, the yoke of bondage that he's talking about there is the law of Moses. And uh, I'll get into it because obviously it's sort of counterintuitive. But you say, well, aren't we supposed to not steal? Aren't we supposed to not murder? <laughs> and I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. But he, he says there, obviously, they came out by stealth uh, to spy our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission, even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. And that is an interesting thing. You know, the fact that, uh, you know, when you look at, these other Judy, Jewish believers coming in and stuff like that. And uh, maybe some of them, even in, in length of years, being Christians longer than the Apostle Paul and, and all of the people there, uh, you know, it says there that the Apostle Paul that, and, and those who were with him did not yield submission to them even for one hour. And I find that quite interesting, you know, that how, you know, in my mind, I try to picture how that worked, you know, how. Uh, they would be respectful and, and loving, but at the same time, you know, uh, there would be this disagreement that we, we, don't, we don't yield to that, we don't submit to that sort of uh, belief system and stuff. So I find that sort of stuff interesting. Verse 6, uh, he says there, But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. And, and that is an amazing thing there as well, is that, uh, you know, some we shouldn't necessarily just look or judge people according to title or position. And that can go both ways. You know, the scripture says we regard no man after the flesh. And so one of the most important things is, I, I, I believe, you know, that we can learn from that is that we don't put more stock on a person necessarily because they're in a position or have a title, you know, of apostle or this or that or the other, but we, 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 we can respect them, but we first weigh, uh, their words, we weigh uh, their life and stuff like that before we, we you know, sort of give any uh, credit or uh, any uh, submission or what have you to them. And it goes the other way as well, is that we don't look down on people, uh, obviously, if they have no position or if they have no title, we don't treat them any less, uh, dis you know, with any less respect or any less honor because they don't have a title, or they don't have a position. Uh, that's exactly what the Lord said. You know, he said, why, why would you, you know, if somebody comes in with fine clothes and, 
uh, you know, fine raiment and then you give him a place of honor and then somebody comes in who doesn't have very nice clothes or whatever you go, I say, sit at my feet. You know, the Lord doesn't work like that and neither should we. You know, as, as he says in Isaiah, you know, the Lord Jesus didn't come to judge with, by what he sees in the natural. He, he looks according to the spirit. He sees with the eyes of the spirit. And, and so we should be exactly the same way in that uh, we don't judge according to the flesh. We don't regard each other according to the flesh, but after Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay. And uh, they say, let's read verse six again. He says there, but from those who seemed to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows no personal favoritism uh, to no man. For those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. In other words, they seemed to be these, these big shots and what have you. But uh, it looks like they, they were just hot air. Amen. Verse 7. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcision also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, or Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. Amen. Verse 11. Can I just uh, stop you there, Mike? I'm just kind of out of thought. In 1998, Simon Pettit, who was uh, an apostle in New Frontiers, sent over to South Africa, um, and they took over a prison in Cape Town, and they were feeding thousands and thousands of people every day. Powerful guy. Um, came over to the conference in 1998 and spoke a message on this verse. Um, remember, the only thing I want you to do is remember the Paul, the very thing that I intended to do, Paul said. Now, this message shaped, um, it was said the most significant message that ever been preached in New Frontiers, apparently, that's what they said. Um, and it affected the way they um, poured money into ministry for the next, I don't know how many years, when he set up lots of ministries to the poor. When actually, looking at it, it's, taking it out of context because I think Paul is actually told our dog has got hold of that daft duck thing. <laughs> we'll wait for you. We'll wait for you. I've got it off him. <laughs> oh. no, no. Um, when it's actually saying the poor that were actually in the church. Yeah. And I know a lot of people use this verse as a means of, um, you know, just saying, God, we, we use this verse because we want to um, spend so much money on poor people. Is he talking to Christians, talking about Christian poor, or is he talking about poor in general? What do you think? Personally, I think uh, all, all in general, all. But uh, you see later on in some of the verses, or is it Ephesians? Oh, I can't remember now. Uh, but he says, especially the household of faith. Uh, yeah. And so I think there is a priority that uh, we should look after our own first. Uh, I personally believe that uh, is, is what Paul was saying, um, is that we look after the church, uh, the poor in the church first. And when, when you see all of the epistles where he's talking about the collections and, and stuff like that, it was for the church. Uh, and, and stuff like that. So, uh, first and foremost, I, I think absolutely the uh, the household of faith first is you know take care of our own household, and then secondly, obviously uh, the community outside. And it doesn't mean you can't do them together. It just means that there's a greater emphasis in looking after the poor in the yes. local church first uh, um, and stuff like that. Didn't and, Jesus uh, say that Paul, you've always got with you, didn't he? Um, you yeah. know, but you don't always have me. This is okay to pour this expensive ointment on my feet and head. Yep. 
Amen. Amen. Okay, excellent. Verse 11. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. And now, um, actually years ago, I, I shared a little message, and I thought this is a brilliant message. It's the power, I, I actually titled it The Power of Godly Confrontation <laughs> and, uh, and stuff like that, because it is. It's, it's, it's something we could have seen could have happened here. And if Paul had just left it, kept his mouth shut, you could have seen something develop in this church that would have caused problems down the line, potentially even a, a split in, in the church. And he says, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to blame. For before certain men came from uh, James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that if, if anything, Barnabas would have been the senior minister at that time. You know, uh, Barnabas would have been the guy who uh, obviously came to fetch Paul. He took Paul under his wing originally and so on and so forth. And yeah, we see. Uh, in a sense, almost Paul's mentor is also, you know, led away with this. But we see the danger of almost uh, racism, if you want to call it that, coming into the church and with the potential of actually in the church at Antioch causing a split. Because obviously Jews in, in, in the Jewish custom was the fact that uh, Gentiles are unclean. So you don't eat with Gentiles uh, and stuff like you don't sit together with them and, and things like that. And so. We see Peter, as, as the apostle says, you know, he's playing the hypocrite here. Uh, basically, he would eat with the Gentiles and, and he would fellowship with the Gentile believers. But as soon as Jewish believers came along, you know, all of a sudden he got nervous about how it seems. You know, I'm hanging out with Gentiles. Yeah, maybe they'll, you know, they'll get upset or, uh, you know, and, and it's a typical picture of the fear of man, uh, you know, putting him in a snare. And, and putting him in, in a trap and potentially causing trouble uh, in the church. And so, you know, this, as I said, could have seriously caused trouble because they could have potentially had the church split. Uh, the work that God was trying to do there could have been disrupted or damaged. And uh, verse 14, uh, you know, the apostle Paul confronts them and he says, but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? And that is an important thing because when they received the Lord Jesus Christ as, as their savior, all of the, uh, the Jewish traditions and laws and all those sort of things, it, to, to a certain extent, they left those things. You know, and that's where the apostle Paul confronted him and say, so, well, you're a Jew, but why are you living like a Gentile now? You know, you're happy to live like a Gentile, but all of a sudden, now you want to say Gentiles must behave like Jews. And so he started to confront him about this. And uh, we who are Jews, verse 15, we who are Jews by nature and not the sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified. Uh, by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Yeah. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. And uh, it's, it's, it's one of those things where he's reminding him again that the message of the gospel is, uh, in a sense, to steal something from the uh, Calvinists, which is not bad, but by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And, yeah. and it's, it's that that where we stand is, is that it is by grace from God. It is through faith, and it is our faith in Christ Jesus alone to save us, not by any attempt of us to do a religious thing or this or that or the other. Right. Verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, 
but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Yeah. For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Yeah. I do not set aside the grace of God, uh, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain, or Christ died for nothing. And uh, it's, it's interesting there. I actually want to, at some point, just jump across to Romans 7. I'll see when we can do that. But he says there, for I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. And actually, let's go to Romans 7 because that is actually a great piece to just uh, connect or, or just sort of stitch in there. Because obviously it's the Apostle Paul who, who wrote that. And uh, from verse 1, Romans 7, verse 1. And uh, he says there, Or do you not know, brothers, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. And so what's the answer? The man must die. If, if I don't want the law to have dominion over me, I need to die. And so he's, we basically... Uh, we know that in Christ, we, we, we are crucified with Christ. We die with Christ and we are, we are raised into a newness of life. But verse two, he says, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from her, uh, from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. And so God is using that picture between the law and us. We are, in a sense, before we come to Christ, we are married to the law. Uh, in, in, in a sense, we are, we, are, we are married to our deeds uh, and how we do and how we perform before God, uh, before we receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 4, he says, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you be, may be married to another, to him who raised him from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work uh, in our members to bear fruit to death. But now, we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Yeah. And uh, I just thought that is, is amazing when you, when you put all of these things together, how, in a sense, they all fit together. And so even here, the Apostle Paul is saying, you know, we have died to the law so that we can be married to christ and when we receive the lord jesus he is the righteous uh he filled he fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law amen and and so we enter into his righteousness when we receive him as lord and savior uh, we enter into his righteousness amen we enter into his life and uh we the old man dies the new man is raised up you know the whole uh story so to speak amen verse three at least not verse 3, chapter 3. <laughs> chapter 3, not verse 3. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? And that's a, that's a powerful word because obviously they knew about witchcraft. They knew about uh, curses and spells and all that, that sort of stuff in those days because there was a lot of sorcery in that day and age. But the the question is, Paul is almost saying, has somebody put a curse on you? 
Have you been hexed? What is going on here? You know, what is this? And uh, he says, this only, verse 2, I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And the important thing is when, they, when he talks about receiving the spirit, we receive the Holy Spirit. When we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, when we're born again, we receive the Holy Spirit as the seal, as the promise, as the down payment of our salvation, the scripture tells us. And so he's asking them now. He says, did you receive that? Did you receive your salvation? Did you receive the seal of the Holy Spirit by faith or by your good deeds? That's basically what he's doing. He's asking, did you receive it by faith or by your effort? And we obviously know the truth is that we receive our salvation through faith. He says, are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? And so he's, he's again bringing uh, this sort of a picture of when you receive by faith, it is by the spirit. But when you try to do it in your own effort, when you try to do it by keeping the law or by doing the religious things and the good things and this, you're doing it by the flesh. When you try to do it in self-effort, it's, it's the flesh. And so he's bringing this thing. He's saying, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, <coughs> does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And so he's asking them, he's saying, uh, you know, when God moves among you, when he does miracles among you, is it by faith or is it by your self-effort in keeping the law? And so he's just painting this picture over and over to them, to them again, you know, uh, to, to remind them of the message that he, he originally preached to them. Amen. He says, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And so when, again, when, when us, when, well, I should say us, but when church, when believers, when, when Christians want to go back to keeping the law, when they want to go back to, uh, you know, keeping the Sabbath or, you know, not eating pork or, or doing all of those things, you, you are basically putting yourself under a curse. You are putting yourself in a position where you are, you're basically the, the, the scripture there is saying you are compelled to keep the law in its entirety, uh, you know, the whole law. And so he says that if you, if you are of the works of the law, in other words, if you want to keep the Sabbath, you want to have yourself circumcised, you want to have all of these things done, then you are under the curse. Remember, the whole point of, of Jesus coming was that nobody could keep the law. Nobody could, uh, could, could uh, fulfill the righteous requirement of the law or keep the law perfect. That is why Jesus came uh, to save us, because none of us could do it. And so he's basically saying, why do you want to go back to that? And uh, so he says, verse 11, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For uh, the just shall live by faith, yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, 
that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Amen. Verse 15. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. Though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And so basically he is saying that when he first called Abraham aside and he made that covenant with him, he by faith, when, when Abraham split the animals down the middle and he made this way of blood for, for them to walk through, he put Abraham into a deep sleep. And it says there was the smoking pillar and this burning furnace that went through the two parts, which is uh, for basically God the Father and God the Son who basically were making covenant together. And Abraham was the sleeping partner at that time. And they made an eternal covenant. Abraham's seed. Jesus is Abraham's seed. And they made an eternal covenant. And basically he is saying that that covenant is, is an eternal promise to Abraham, uh, basically. And that 430 years later, the law that, that was brought in cannot uh, annul that contract. It cannot take away uh, what, what uh, basically the God the Father and God the Son did uh, in, in that uh, covenant where, where Abraham was basically put to sleep and God did the covenant. Uh, Genesis 17, I think it is. And so, you know, we can, we can have a look at that and see that God's intention originally from all time was for men to live by faith uh, and to have this faith in him. Abraham, in a sense, experienced the grace of God up until uh, basically the giving of the Lord, Mount Sinai. The, the Jews experienced the grace of God. They experienced uh, God's promise because you see them, um, you know, complaining and this and that and what have you and throwing tantrums before the law was given. And uh, God just responds to them. He just says, okay, fine, give you this, give you that. As soon as the law is given, the very day that the law was given on, on Pentecost, 3,000 Jews died, uh, uh, basically for sinning and transgressing. And so we see that uh, there was just this period of time, that's when we talk about these dispensations, you know, where God just treated in different times, he just treated uh, people differently. But I'm moving away, from, I'm digressing, I shouldn't, I'm, let me come back. Um, but the whole point being, is that the law, keeping the law or doing uh, certain things to, to improve your position with God is of no value. You know, what Jesus did for us is a complete and total victory. It, it give, he gives us, because we uh, access God through faith and we access God through what Jesus did, through Jesus' obedience, through Jesus' sacrifice, we get treated as though, in a sense, we were Jesus because we're entering in through him, in a sense, if that makes sense. And so our, our standing with God, our righteousness that we have, is all based on what Jesus did, not on our works, not on our performance or our behavior. And so we have full and complete access to God and we also have peace with God. We have total peace with God uh, because of what Jesus did. And so many times, and, and how many of you have done this? You've messed up. And then for the next three days, you punish yourself. God, I messed up. Oh, and you sort of get down on yourself and get angry with yourself. And, and in a sense, you're trying to punish yourself to make yourself right before God sometimes. And uh, obviously, there's, there's a point where you you uh, you know you 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 do say, oh Father, I didn't, I, I messed up, and I repent. 
and, and you come back. But then you should forget it because God has forgotten it. You know, it has been dealt with. Uh, this way you want to beat yourself up for the next three days is not right. You know, you've got to trust. Your trust is not in your performance. Your trust is in uh, Jesus' performance, in his righteousness, in his saving grace. Amen. Okay, verse 19. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now the mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could give life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined us all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under God by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. And so what does the law do? You know, when you see uh, some of these evangelists, like uh, was it Ray Comfort and that, uh, when they share the gospel, they will, they, uh, out, out on the streets and they witness, and you see t- their technique is always, well, you know, when God says, no, I'm all right, I'm fine. You go, well, have you ever lied? You know, have you ever stolen anything? And more times than not, they go, yes, yes. I said, have you ever looked at uh, another person with uh, lust in your heart? And they'll go, yes. You know, and so he says, by your own admission, you're a lying, thieving, stealing, adulterer at heart. And so uh, he says, how would the God of the universe uh, judge you? And uh, he would say, I'm guilty. And so that is what the law does. The law shows us our, our need for a savior. It teaches us the fact that we have transgressed that we have sinned and we need a savior. And he's basically saying, so the law was our tutor until Christ. He says, but once faith has come, we are no longer under the tutor. And so uh, it's, it's that wonderful thing. The law points us to Christ. The law points us to Jesus because we need a savior. If, if uh, let's put it this way, it's, 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 uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Basically, it's it's there to be a road marker uh, for for people. If people think they're all right, they think they're on the right path or not on the right path. Uh, the law basically shows them exactly where they're at, and so they go, "My God, I need a Lord. I need a Savior. Jesus, save me. Save me from my sin." And so that is what the law does. But once once you are saved, you, you basically are buried with Christ. You die, the old man dies, and you are raised up in Christ in the newness of life. And so you are, no, you are dead to the law, and you're alive in Christ. And he says, verse 26, for you are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ. Baptism, what is baptism a picture of? As I said, you're going under the waters of baptism. They're saying the old man is dying. You are dead to your old man. And you are uh, you have now put on Christ. You have raised up out of the water this new man. You are raised from the dead. You pass from death to life. Amen. He says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, singular, and heirs according to the promise. And uh, I'm reading from the Passion Translation, and I thought this is quite interesting. It's uh, so until the re- revelation, is verse 23. So until the revelation of faith for salvation was released, the law was a jailer holding us as prisoners until the lock and key, until the faith, which was destined to be revealed, would set us free. So it's quite interesting that the law is the jailer and faith is the key. Right. 
Yeah. On that subject, I, I remember reading a commentary by an old Welsh commentator called Cadellan Jones. They're very rare, these commentaries. And, and he was speak, said in the olden days, you know, the Bible says the Lord was a schoolmaster that brought us to Christ. Yeah. And the schoolmaster, he said, was not uh, the person that taught. The schoolmaster was the one that collected the children from their homes and led them through the streets to the teacher. So mm -hmm. he said, just in the same way, the law was that schoolmaster that led us to Christ. Yeah. The bus Amen. driver. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Amen. 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 And so, anybody else want? No, it's good. Okay. Excellent. Well, <laughs> just to just to uh, close this, I won't go to chapter four. So I see we've we've spent enough time on on uh, just these first three chapters, but. Um, you know, people will ask, well, don't we need to keep the law? You know, don't we need to keep these rules and this and that and the other? What's what's the difference? Oh, what is, you know, the Bible talks about those who are lawless, the lawless people and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And Jesus says those, you know, get lost and so on and so forth. And and the difference is when when you try to keep the law, you know, when you try to be good and you try to do these things, you are doing it in your flesh. That is an it's an outward attempt to to do a spiritual thing, but when you become born again, right? The the uh, Jeremiah prophesied this. He's uh, he said that uh, God would write His law in your heart, yes. and so when when you are born again and the Holy Spirit recreates you and makes you a brand new creature on the inside, God's law, if you want to put it that way, is encoded in your spiritual DNA. And so now what, what happens is we, we are what, what the law says we need to do. When we are born again, that is who we are. And so uh, if I can put it this way, when we pursue God, when we seek God, when we walk after the Spirit and things like that, we naturally do the, the, those things. We, uh, when when uh, we walk according to the love and the life that is in us, then we don't want to steal from our neighbor. We don't want to covet his possessions. We love him. So you don't do that. You know, you don't. Um, and that is where uh, later on in, in uh, Galatians, he talks about, he says, love. Uh, when you love your neighbor as you love yourself, uh, you have fulfilled the law. Um, that, is, that is basically uh, when, when uh, you walk in love towards God first and to, towards those around you, uh, you won't steal from your neighbor. You won't kill your neighbor. You won't steal his wife. Uh, you know, you won't covet his possessions and all of these sort of things because that's not who you are, yeah. you know? And so the more we walk off to God, the more we, we set our eyes on him, the more the fruit of the spirit uh, comes out. And, and, and basically then we naturally do these things. And so later on in Galatians, he says, uh, he basically talks about, you know, walk after the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And so many Christians say, oh, well, Lord Jesus, I want to walk in the spirit. You know, I'm not going to fulfill. I'm going to put all my effort into not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. And then I will be able to walk in the spirit, which is backwards. And, and he's saying, no, you know, if, you do, if you've got fleshly issues, just walk after me and those things will fall by the side. If, if you've got uh, whatever this, that, the other, he says, if you set your eyes on me and you just walk after me, you will not fulfill those things. And so many times people do it backwards and, uh, you know, think, well, if I get rid of all these stuff, I'll be able to walk in the spirit. And that's not, Jesus has already made and given us access to walk in the spirit. And so we walk in the spirit and then we don't do those things. It, it, you understand what I mean? And so that, that is the difference, um, is that we don't keep an outward law. When we walk after God, when we set our eyes on Jesus, then what he's put on the inside, his law written in our new DNA, in our hearts, in our spiritual DNA, when we walk after him, when we set our eyes on him, when we set our eyes on the word, we naturally do it. We don't even have to try, in a sense. Uh, the, 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 the 
pre- the, you will always see the conflict here is not about uh, keeping the law or you know walking off this, but it's always about uh, when when the apostle Paul makes the distinction: Are you walking after the spirit or are you walking after the flesh? And he, he always say, well, if you're walking after the flesh, these are the things that you see when you walk after the flesh. And he says, if you're walking after the spirit, this is the fruit that you will see when you walk in the spirit. And so uh, that's where our pursuit needs to be the father. Our pursuit needs to be walking with the Lord. And uh, basically, when we do face temptations, uh, that is is more, it's, it's we set our eyes more to the Lord because uh, the scripture in Corinthians 10, 2 Corinthians 10, says that he makes a way of escape from the temptation that, that we're facing or difficulty that we're facing. And so it's always to set our eyes on Jesus, to, to fix our eyes on, on him and, uh, and, and walk that way. Amen. Amen. So I thought we'd leave it there. Uh, I don't know if this is something that uh, we do in the future in the sense of go through various epistles. I, I personally like it. I think it's nice to, uh, you know, have it read and, you know, people, you know, give commentary and add in and, and things like that. So, you know, if it's something we want to do in the future, well, praise God. 